Hello! This is the third and final video on position analysis in the Game Theory Problem Solving series. Make sure you watch the first two videos as they are a primer for this video. Today we're going to be looking at just one game, the game of NIM. NIM is a game with a very simple rule set, but turns out to have really complex and interesting gameplay. As we work towards finding a winning strategy, we'll find some really interesting and surprising maths comes up along the way. Variants of NIM have been played for centuries, as far back as the 1600s in Europe, but thought to originate in ancient China. In fact, the game of 21 Dares, which we looked at a couple of videos ago, is a simple variant of one pile NIM, and Withoff's game is a variant of two pile NIM. Let me quickly remind you how NIM works. We are looking at the variant called Normal NIM. There are three piles containing three, five, and seven marbles respectively. Two players take turns to choose a pile and remove any number of marbles from it, as long as they take at least one. So they could take the whole pile if they wanted to. The player who takes the last marble wins. Before we think about the full game, let's get our hands dirty and think about a simpler version of the game. What happens if there's just one pile of marbles? This version of the game is quite boring because it's easy to see that player one can win by just taking the whole pile on their first turn. This also means that if we start with more than one pile, we want to avoid reducing the game to a single pile because this will allow our opponent to win. What if we start with two piles of size three and five, say? This already is a lot more complex than the one pile game. The strategy is not obvious at all. Before launching straight into position analysis, we can put a bit of effort into finding a strategy by intuition. We already know that we don't want to completely remove a pile, because this allows our opponent to win. What if we take all of the marbles from a pile except one? Well, then the other player can empty the other pile of all but one marble, and then they can win on their next turn. We want to avoid this and instead force our opponent either to leave a single pile or leave two piles, one of which has a single marble. Clearly, if we leave two marbles in each pile, our opponent will be forced to do one of these things, but we can't arrange this on our first turn. So we want to aim for this and prevent our opponent from leaving us with two piles of two. There's something special about the configuration of two piles of two, which stands out to me as a problem solver. There is a symmetry since both piles have the same size. Finding symmetry in your problem can often be very useful, and this is the case here. Suppose we leave our opponent with two equal piles, each with n marbles. Because they can only take marbles from one pile on their go, they must leave the piles uneven after their turn. This means that if we can make the two piles even on our first turn, then our opponent will always make the piles uneven, and we can always even them up again. This way we can be sure of eventually leaving them with two piles of two, or two piles of one, and win. Always supposing that they don't remove an entire pile, which gives us the win anyway. The first player can do this on their first turn, taking two marbles from the pile of five, leaving two piles of three so the first player has the winning strategy. In fact, this will be the same for any game of NIM starting with two piles of unequal size. If the game starts with two equal piles, then player two has the winning strategy, because player one must make the piles uneven on their first turn. That was already quite hard work, and there were only two piles. Actually, if you think about it carefully, what we were doing was position analysis in a roundabout and convoluted way. Now we want to think about having three piles at the start, with sizes 3, 5, and 7. If you haven't already, I encourage you to pause the video and really think about the three pile case. Can you do something like what we did with two piles? You should be able to convince yourself that you don't want to just reduce the game to two piles and the strategy of making all three piles equal doesn't work either. What about making two of the piles equal? Solving the problem with such an approach is not impossible, but it's very difficult. Let's now do position analysis. 
you'll see that it's very procedural. You can easily get a computer to do it, for example, which in some ways is a good thing, but on the other hand, it's less insightful about how the game is working. As always, we need to label all the possible game positions. The state of the game is determined by the number of marbles in each pile at the start of a player's turn. So say A, B and C. The order of these numbers matters, so we can represent a state of the game by the ordered list A, B, C. The starting position for the game is 3, 5, 7. We need some way to represent all the possible positions in the game. You may have noticed that a triple, A, B, C, corresponds to a point in three-dimensional space. So the ideal way of representing the positions would be using three dimensions. Alas, YouTube doesn't support holograms yet, so I'm going to do my best to use two dimensions. I shall represent the number of marbles in piles two and three using a two-dimensional array and I'll represent the number of marbles in the first pile using different copies of this array. So this point here corresponds to position 0, 4, 2, and this point corresponds to position 2, 0, 6. The triple of numbers 0, 0, 0 does not correspond to a position of the game, because if all the piles are empty, the game has already finished. We know that if there is just a single pile left, this is a winning position, so we can mark all positions corresponding to there being just one non-empty pile as winning positions. Now we need to spot the first set of losing positions. These are the positions where however many marbles you take from any of the piles, you will leave your opponent in a winning position. We can interpret this geometrically. These positions correspond to points where every point to the left or below them in the array, or in the corresponding position in another array representing a smaller first pile, is a winning position. At this stage, there are three new losing positions, corresponding to there being two non-empty piles with one marble each. We've worked through this process a few times, so I'm going to fast forward through it. Let's sit back Roll the music and watch the algorithm play out. The result is that the starting position, 3, 5, 7, is a winning position. So player 1 has a winning strategy, which is always to move to leave player 2 in a losing position. It's not very easy to interpret this strategy and say why it works, beyond that it does. We have solved the problem I set, but as with the other games we have looked at, it's natural to want to generalise to a game of NIM starting with n piles containing x1, x2, x3, up to xn marbles, respectively. There is a problem with trying to do position analysis for the general game. The larger n is, and the larger the xi's are, the longer it will take. And it's not possible to do position analysis for every game because we can make the number of piles arbitrarily large. How then to proceed? Well, let's look more closely at the geometry. This is a 3D plot of all the states in our 357 game of NIM. It's difficult to see what is going on, so let's just focus on the losing positions as there are fewer of them. That's tidier but still not clear what is going on. We can see, however, that it's not random. See here, some of those points form a tetrahedron, which doesn't seem likely to be coincidental. What we need is more points. 
Here, I have plotted all the losing positions for a game of Nim starting with three piles of 100 marbles each. Look at that! Astonishingly, this complex mathematical pattern is hiding in the losing states. You may recognise this pattern. It's a three-dimensional version of Sapinski's triangle. But can we use this to describe the winning strategy for any game of Nim? Well, there are some losing positions which jump out as interesting. They are the positions where the pattern transitions from filled in to empty tetrahedra. This position, for example, is 0, 64, 64. This one is 0, 32, 32. And we also have 0, 16, 16, 0, 8, 8, 0, 4, 4, and 0, 2, 2. This suggests that powers of 2 are important. Indeed, if you've come across Sipinski's triangle before, you may know that it is closely connected to powers of 2. Also, you may remember that something interesting happened during position analysis when we filled in the first four rows and columns, which is another manifestation of this same power of 2 phenomenon. After playing about with different ideas, you might try representing the sizes of the piles using binary numbers instead of normal base 10 numbers, and try and spot a pattern. Here are some losing positions chosen more or less at random. Writing them out in binary, is there anything you notice? It's kind of odd, the ones seem to pair up. That might just be coincidence, but if you check other losing positions, you will see that this pattern persists. How do ones pairing up relate to picking up marbles? Writing the pile sizes in binary corresponds to breaking up the piles into smaller piles of size 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Then pairing ones means that we can pair up these subpiles. Does this remind you of anything we did earlier? When we were looking at the two-pile game of Nim, we reasoned that the winning strategy was always to try and make the two piles the same size. This strategy didn't translate obviously to the three-pile game, but here we can see a version of it working in binary. We can visualise this strategy working for our 3, 5, 7 game. At the start, player 1 wants to even up the subpiles, and then just do the same on each of their turns. All this suggests a conjecture for the winning strategy of 3 pile nim. Always play to leave your opponent with piles, such that the binary subpiles pair up. In fact, this strategy is applicable to an n-pile game of nim. Having made a conjecture, we still have to prove that it's correct. That's a job I'm going to leave for you in the comments. There are two things that you need to show. The first is that if the binary subpiles don't pair up, then the player can always move to make them pair up. This means that the player with the winning strategy can always employ it. The second is that if the binary subpiles do pair up, then any move the other player makes will leave some subpile unpaired. This means that the player without a winning strategy can't steal the winning strategy. Try proving these for the three-pile game and then generalising to n-piles. We might have already seen a visual verification of one of these points earlier in the video. See if you can spot it. I will put a link in the description to the 1901 paper by Charles Boughton, who was the first person to mathematically study NIM and provide a winning strategy. It's a charming and short paper which is quite easy to read. As I mentioned at the start, the game we have looked at is just one of many variants of NIM called Normal NIM. Normal, in the context of mathematical games, just means that the last player to move is the winner. Usually, people play the variant of NIM called Misere NIM, where the player who takes the last marble loses. Another challenge for you in the comments is to modify the winning strategy for Normal NIM slightly to turn it into a winning strategy for Misere NIM. In the next video, we are sticking with mathematical games, but looking at a new technique. As a teaser for that, have a look at the following problem on a variant of noughts and crosses. Misere noughts and crosses. I'm sure you're all aware of how to play noughts and crosses, or tic-tac-toe. Two players take it in turns, placing either a nought or a cross in a 3x3 grid. Just as with misere nim, 
In misere, noughts and crosses, the first person to make three in a row is the loser rather than the winner. The question is, does either player have a winning strategy or can both players force a draw? As ever, put your solution to or ideas about the problem in the comments. Thank you for watching. I know I went slightly off-piste in this video, but I was so excited when I found Sapinski's triangle, I just had to share it. I hope you enjoyed. See you in the next video.